In my almost decade of being a parent, I've had the same scenario play out so many times that I have a song that I go to with it. Over the t- nine years I've been a parent, my daughters have come out countless times in the middle of the night, terrified when they're little toddlers, and they go, Dad, I can't sleep in my room. And I go, why? And they go, because something is in there. You've had that experience, right? When you're a kid, as a parent, you've been there. And so I, I had this song that I sing that uh, I, I did write myself. I don't mean to brag, but I did. It's an original. And it goes like this. There are no monsters in Avery's room. There are no monsters in Adeline's room. So you don't have to be scared. I, I mean, I did get a round of applause in first service, but that's cool. Now, I mean, that song, but that song itself brings up a lot of questions. Like the first one, Luke, how has Brent not asked you to sing with the band? I don't know. Why'd you laugh? I don't know. That's a real question. The second question, though, is why does a toddler know that monsters exist? If in the mind of a toddler a monster exists, it means that you know what else doesn't exist? A good night's sleep for the parents. If all of us parents rallied together, I feel like we could just say, hey, enough with the monsters. We want to be able to sleep at night and we could get rid of them. I feel like we could do that. But the reason we can't do that is because we can't get rid of what monsters represent. No amount of coordinated effort by all the parents in the world could get rid of the one thing that monsters all represent. Now, monsters have been around for thousands of years. Some believe that it was the ancient Greeks who were the first ones to write about monsters. Others believe that you can go even farther back and see that monsters were part of the collective imagination long before them. Uh, One of the earliest cave etchings that we have, this comes from the south of France, and it's been dated by some historians between 10,000 B.C. and 13,000 B.C. And it's this group of like half man, half beast conglomerations. So this is the, the etching, and this is what people believed it originally looked like. So you have this mixture of a person and a deer, kind of all together, just kind of weird looking, I'm going to be honest with you. But again, it's like 13,000 years old, so let's give them some slack. But we have these collections that you find of etchings like this in the south of France and in Spain. And as modern people with all the technological advances, we shouldn't really look down on our prehistoric relatives. They didn't have all the technological pieces of uh, advance that we have. They didn't have lighting, they didn't have cameras, they didn't have drones, they didn't have Facebook, which they could use to kind of like look in their cell phone records of all the monsters who are on Facebook. It's a little technological joke about, never mind. I guess you're cool being spied on. Anyway, they don't have that. So we can't look at them and go, what's wrong with those people? But the problem is they're still here today, even though all the advances that we have Monsters are still part of the collective imagination because these fake monsters represent the real fears that we have. They bring them to the surface. They put claws and skin and fur upon the very real fears that we all have. And so when the big bad wolf appears with his asthmatic propensity for huffing and puffing, it makes us wonder how much security do we really have in our house? When an oversized great white shark develops a human-like revenge, we feel like our boat is too small and maybe we ourselves are just too small. When Godzilla shows up and the ground beneath us, beneath us begins to shake, we wonder just how much strength we have. Because monsters put on fur and flesh and skin the fears that we all have, the fear that I'm not enough, that I don't have enough, that I don't matter, that I'm out of control. And monsters have always represented that, even in Scripture. In Scripture, the the biblical writers talk about two specific monsters. You have the hippopotamus-like behemoth, and then you have the alligator-like leviathan. Let Let me read a couple sections of text to you about these. This is the behemoth from the book of Job, chapter 41. Look at the behemoth which I made just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. Its strength is in its loins and its power in the muscles of its belly. 
It makes its tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are knit together. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs like bars of iron. Uh, Here is uh, scripture talking about the Leviathan. This is from Isaiah 27. On that day, the Lord with this cruel and great strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will kill the dragon that is in the sea. In case you're going to the beach this summer, just remember that. Job 41, can you draw Leviathan with a fish hook or press down its tongue with a cord? And so often these, these monsters are talked about in Scripture in the context of one specific thing. Often when a Leviathan or a behemoth is referenced, it's in the context of creation. Creation. That's when the monsters come out. So in Genesis 1, we have the first creation account, and it goes like this. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. So Genesis 1, when the world's created, there's chaotic water. It's formless and void. It's just this, this blank water everywhere. While the wind from God swept wind or breath, those words mean the same thing in Hebrew, swept over the face of the water. So that's what it is. And then verse 6 and 7, this is God's response. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. So when Genesis describes creation, the earth is formless and void. There's waters that God separates. That's how Genesis 1 describes creation. But watch how in Psalm 74, God's creative act doesn't just overcome the chaotic waters, but now it's one of the monsters. Let me read this to you. Psalm 74. Yet God, my king, is from of old, working salvation in the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the dragons in the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You cut openings for springs and torrents. You dried up every flowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You established the luminaries and the sun. So God, you were the one who created everything. You made the stars and the In the sky, you separated the waters, and in this creative process, you destroyed the monsters. And so the real important question to ask isn't, are the monsters real? Is there really a dragon? The real question that we need to ask is, what do these monsters represent? What are they putting fur, flesh, and skin upon? What is it that Israel is so afraid of that monsters become a proxy for? And it's the same things that we're afraid of, of being out of control, of chaos, of being powerless, of being weak. And monsters, it's not about monsters, it's about what they represent. And the reason that no matter how advanced we become as people, that we never get rid of monsters, is because we can never get rid of what monsters represent. And if anything, our climate right now is more a hotbed for the creation of monsters than ever. There's a pastor in uh, Kansas City. He's named Adam Hamilton. He's the uh, founding pastor of the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. And a few months ago, he did a survey of his parishioners and asked them how much fear they have. And so he asked 2,400 parishioners about how much fear they had in their life. And 85% of the people surveyed said they have moderate to severe levels of fear all the time. And we've never taken a survey here at Westover, but we do pass out prayers of the people cards every so often. And we ask our congregation to write down, what are the, the things that are on your heart? What are your prayers? And the prayers of the people exercise seems to always reveal the same thing. But there's fear. There's fear of the effect that technology is having on us. Fear of the effect technology is having on our kids. Fear of our finances. Fear of the future. Fear that I'm not enough. Fear that I don't have enough. Fear of what's happening next. We even fear talking about fear. And this is more the gentlemen, not the ladies as much. 
Guys don't want to say, I'm afraid. And so here's what we say. We say, I'm just really stressed. I'm stressed. But if you, you go a few layers underneath that stress, then what you find is anxiety and worry and outright fear. Fearful. So of course there's monsters around. And the thing is, our culture is not helping us. Our culture peddles in fear. Our media has learned long ago that fear creates views. And so if it bleeds, it leads. And it creates perceptions that are nowhere connected to reality. Like our perception of how much violent crime is out there is not connected to the reality of how much violent crime is out there. Uh, Let me show you this, these two uh, graphs, side by side. And these graphs come from Pew Research and Gallup and the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And these two graphs show, on the one, this is percent of Americans saying that there is more crime this year than last year. And if you look from starting 1993 all the way to 2015, People have said, the majority of them have said, we have more crime now than we did last year. More violent crime right now than last year. That's the public perception. Reality shows that violent crimes, this is per 1,000 people, has diminished substantially since 1993. 80 down to around 20. The murder rates now are close to where they were all the way back in 1964 you're far more likely, you're actually 40 times more likely to die from a heart attack than you are from a violent crime. Which as I say, it doesn't sound that encouraging. Sorry. Um, But our perception of things to be afraid of far surpasses the reality because if it bleeds, it leads. It gets clicks, it gets views, it sells products. It wins political campaigns. We've seen this every time there's an election cycle. We connect the opponent to something that we're afraid of, and that's how we're going to win. And so we're afraid of conservatives. We're afraid of liberals. We're afraid of Hollywood. We're afraid of immigrants. We're afraid of people who look different from us. We're afraid of people who think different from us. We're afraid of people who who are destroying the bedrock of our society. We're we're afraid of people who are preventing us from progressing as a society. That's what politics does. Uh, Here's a piece by Alex Altman talking about fear in politics. He says, fear has always been an effective form of political rhetoric and one deployed to great effect by countless presidents. As George W. Bush rallied support for the war on terrorism, His administration introduced a color-coded threat matrix that never dropped below yellow. To push his crime bill, Bill Clinton warned that without a crackdown on violent juveniles, our country is going to be living with chaos. Richard Nixon said, people are motivated by fear, not by love. And we see this. There's fear all around us. And in a truly dysfunctional cycle... What often happens when we feel afraid is that I'm going to go to someone who can give me information to confirm my fear. So if I'm afraid, I'm going to click on cable news or I'm going to go on social media and I'm going to find a story or a report which validates how I feel, which further perpetuates what's there. And the reason we can't get rid of monsters is because we can't get rid of what monsters represent. They represent the very real fears that we all have. Fears that we're out of control. Fears that we don't know how to take care of ourselves. We don't know how to take care of our kids. Fear that I'm not good enough. It's all around us. So the question becomes, what what do you do? What do you do do when a monster appears? Well, go back to when you were a kid. Go back to when you were a little kid and you're in your, your bedroom at night and you're trying to fall asleep. You got your little pajamas on, you've been laying there for 10 minutes, and, and the trailers for your dreams are starting to play. You know that moment right there? And then you hear this sound in your closet. And like your heart rate goes to the boiling point, and like your eyes roll up like curtains, like it's just wide awake, and you just sit there frozen for what seems like an eternity. It's, 
It's only been 30 seconds, but it seems like an eternity. And you're hoping you never hear that sound again, but then you hear something. And then you have to make the decision. It's a tough choice. Do you stay in your bed and pull the curtain, or the, the sheets over your head and hide? And hope that that monster goes and eats your brother? <laughs> or do you get out of the bed, grab a flashlight, and grab something to use as a weapon, and do you walk to your closet? Do you hide or do you confront? Do, do you run or do you face? It's the same question we face as adults. And we don't hide by literally pulling sheets over our head, but we have our own way of doing that. Maybe we're so afraid in here that we just get so obsessed with what's out there. Like, I'm, I'm just going to dive into my work. And I'm going to do really good at work, whatever my work is, whether I, I work from home and it's raising my kids or it's going to the office and, and making money. I'm going to just fully invest in those things so I never have to enter into here. Or it's the vices. I'm going to abuse alcohol or food or sex. I'm going to be numbed by entertainment. Do we run and hide or do we embrace them? G.K. Chesterton said, Chesterton said a fairy tale doesn't teach our kids that monsters exist. It teaches our kids that monsters can be defeated. The reason that we tell fairy tales that have monsters in them is so that we learn one simple truth. That for you to be who you need to be, who you are created to be, who you want to be, it requires you to go where you don't want to go. And that's every monster story. When the monster comes into the village and takes the kid, and takes the kid into the deep, dark recesses of his cave, what does the hero do? She leaves the safety of the village, and she goes to find the kid. She goes where she doesn't want to go. When the great white shark appears, what does Captain Brody do? Even though he's afraid of the water, he goes out into the water. Fairy tales don't teach us that monsters exist. They teach us that they can be defeated. And for us today, it's the same response. That you have to go where you don't want to go so that you can be who you were created to be. A few months ago, my, my youngest daughter, my three-year-old daughter, Audrey, came out of her bedroom in the middle of the night, and she said, Dad, there's a monster on my ceiling. And my first thought was, I've got a sermon series about this, so thank you. So, all right, let's go to your bedroom, Audrey. And so we go to the, her bedroom, and then she, she grabs my hand. She goes, Dad, look up at the ceiling. There's a, there's a dragon on the ceiling. And I look up, and there's a red light on the ceiling that's blinking. To a three-year-old, it looks like a monster. To me, it looks like a warning sign. It's a warning sign that the smoke detector has a battery that needs to be replaced. To her, it looks like a monster. To me, I know that's a warning. That if I heed the advice of that warning, it'll save us. Monsters are warnings. These fears, these anxieties, they're warning signs to listen and to learn from them. And so what we're going to do during this series over the next eight or nine weeks, or maybe ten, is we're going to talk about how we need to learn to go into the dark and how these things can be warnings that save us. And we're eventually going to talk about some specific monsters, monsters like comparison, success, and more. And what we're going to learn is these monsters can be the very thing that save us if we learn to listen, to hear what's really underneath it. And so you have to go in the dark to befriend your monster. And the reason we do this it's because God is with us. We, we know that if we don't face our fears, these fears will always haunt us. If we don't confront them, they will always control us. If we don't befriend them, then we will always be slaves to them. So we go into the dark, and the reason we do is because God is with us. I, I've got a confession to make. E even though I, I work at churches, and I've, I've done this my entire adult lifetime, I'm just a little bit afraid of being in church buildings when the lights are out and no one else is here. Just a little bit afraid. 
And I appreciate y'all having my back on that, not laughing at me. Thank you. But I have a reason for this. I have a very, very good reason for this, in my opinion. My own diagnosis. It's a good reason, Luke. Thank you. My first job uh, in Florida, uh, the way our building was set up is that we had, uh, the lights were on one wall, and then the security um, machine was on another wall. And so you had to turn the lights off, and then you turn the, secure, the alarm on, and then you'd have to leave quickly. And so one Wednesday night I'm doing this, and I, I go and turn the lights off, and then I go over and turn the alarm on. And as I turn the alarm on, I turn around, and I try to make my way to the front door. And what I see on the end of a couch, out of my purview, is the shiny bald head of a six-foot-six parishioner who just weeks before was a prisoner in the state uh, correctional facility. And I look over, and I'm terrified. Now, he also is terrified. He's upset because he's lost his place to sleep that night because he has nowhere else to sleep. And he was trying to sleep in the church building. I was upset because I lost all my self-respect and dignity by what I yelled when I saw him. <laughs> Ever since then, I've been afraid. Just a little bit. There's going to be a large, bald man just waiting in the room. But let me tell you, I've never been afraid of a church building when there are other people in it. Like, I never have. I've never been afraid of being in a church building when other people are there. And I go to elders' meetings, honestly. I'm not afraid. Because <laughs> you're not alone. There's some hundred plus times that Scripture tells us, do not be afraid. And often there is one phrase that goes right after it every time. Almost every time Scripture says, do not be afraid, it's followed with the same sort of caveat. Let me read a couple of these texts to you and see if you can figure it out. Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Isaiah says this, Isaiah 41. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you. This is Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Do not be afraid. Some hundred plus times is said in the scripture. And the phrase that almost always follows it is God saying, for I am with you. When Moses goes to face Pharaoh, do not be afraid, for I am with you. When David faces the giant Goliath, do not be afraid, for I am with you. When Daniel is in the lion's den, do not be afraid, for I am with you. And that same promise is for us. When you face the monster, the fear that you have for the future, how am I going to take care of bills and how is everything going to work? God says, do not be afraid because I am with you. And the fear that you have is this fear of, maybe I just, something's wrong with me and I'm not enough. God says, do not be afraid for I am with you. How, how am I going to take care of my kids? God says, do not be afraid, for I am with you. And just being with one other person when a monster appears doesn't always solve the thing. Like, being with just one other thing doesn't always help. Right? Like, if a monster broke into my house and it was just me and my dog, it wouldn't help. My dog is 20 pounds of uselessness. Wouldn't do anything. When Lindsay and I first got married, we had two dogs whose combined weight was 220 pounds. Now, they have since gone to that beautiful playground in the sky. But back when they were around, if someone broke in, I would feel great with those dogs being around. Because they could actually do something. We're not afraid. Because not just anyone is with us, but God is with us. And so when you're afraid of, of dealing with your shame, of the ways that you have made the world a worse place, the way that you have hurt others, the way you've hurt yourself. You can go into that shame, and you can say, I am a sinner. You can confess that, because the God who is full of mercy is the one who is with you. A few weeks ago, when the bombs were going off in Austin, and people were afraid, we can say as Christians, I'm not afraid. We can be Christians who utter the words of Scripture, for from dust you came, and to dust you shall return. Because the one with us is the God who has conquered death. And so we're not afraid. 
Frederick Buechner said uh, these words that you might have heard before. He said, here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Do not be afraid. In this world, there will be reasons for you to be afraid. There will be monsters that appear in your life. But because God is with you, you don't have to be afraid. Because you're not alone in that. And and so you're willing to go into the darkness and trust that, that the God of resurrection is able to teach you something by the very things that you fear. The very insecurities that you have when placed in the hands of God, go from being monsters on your ceiling to being warning signs that can save you. Now those things that you want to run from might be the very things you need to run to. Because for you to be who God created you to be, it often means you going into the place that you don't want to be. Because that's where we find the power of God, the God who is with you in all things the God who is present in all things. 